and Jeremy Clark for choreographing and creating and organizing this event. Uh, this has been weeks in the making, and we appreciate y'all's willingness to do this. I also want to welcome those of you who are here. We have faculty, staff, students from this college who are here to honor Dr. Tucker, and many distinguished guests from around the state of Florida and elsewhere. Um, welcome. We are delighted to have you with us and to share this moment with Dr. Tucker. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank um, Mary F. Lane, for whom this professorship is named. Mary and her husband Chip are loyal gators. They are among the best friends this college has ever had. Um, it is their generosity that made this endowed professorship possible, their gift which guarantees that the most distinguished senior academic in the Department of Health Education and Behavior will be acknowledged and supported, both now and in perpetuity. A hundred years from now, you can come back and ask to meet, it may not be Jay Lee, <laughs> but one of her successors will be here for sure. Um, not everyone is here is an, is an academic, and you may not understand why we're celebrating this um, uh, appointment. To give you a little bit of perspective, I would say that out of, I don't know, the, the many students who are going to graduate and get degrees this year, a tiny fraction will be getting PhD degrees. Among all of the PhDs who graduate this year, only a subset will make it to a tenure track position at a major university like the University of Florida. Among those who do make it to a, a faculty position, only a subset of those make it to tenure as an associate professor, and then a fraction of those make it to tenured full professor, which is the highest academic rank in North America is a tenured full professor. Even among this elite group, there is one more level, one more recognition that most of us full professors do not achieve. And that is an endowed professorship or an endowed chair. So you see the very select group to which Jay Lee is being in, in, um, installed. And we are very pleased to do that. She has earned it. To talk a little bit about her career and the qualifications um, for which Jay Lee was selected to this position, um, I'd like to turn the microphone over to the chair of the Department of Health, Education, and Behavior, Dr. Mildred Maldonado Molina. Mildred? Well, first, I want to say thank you for all of you for making time to be here to help us recognize and celebrate this uh, achievement and recognition. And it is uh, my honor and my pleasure to be able to do the introduction for Dr. Tucker today. Okay, we practiced this. <laughs> And it worked just fine <laughs> when I practice it, right? So again, I just want to uh, put some of, of this uh, honor in context, what uh, the Mary Lane Endowed Professor means. And it is an honor for an outstanding behavioral scientist. It recognizes a distinguished career 
research program in preventing pr risky behaviors among youth. And to do that, it takes decades of, of work. And that's what we are here uh, to celebrate and to recognize. So I want to give you a very quick overview of Dr. Tucker's trajectory. She joined University of Florida in 1979 as a grad right after finishing her PhD in clinical psychology. And she joined University of Florida to do the internship in clinical psychology. Since then, joined the ranks of a junior new faculty for about a decade at the University of Florida, and then was able to continue her career at different uh, institutions. What I want to highlight is that in about 10 years ago, she decided to join UF again in 2014. And in 2014, that's when she joined us as department chair for uh, the department. So we acknowledge and recognize her for her service and that role. And then they established the Center for Behavioral Economic Health Research in 2016. So right after that, she had an opportunity to be a visiting professor at the University of New Mexico and recently received a recognition at the, from the University UF Term Professorship. And why we're here today is to celebrate and recognize her as uh, the endowed professorship. So I'm going to have two minutes to give you some of her current uh, recognitions and contributions. Right now, she is the PI of a national federally uh, project. It's a five-year project, over $2 million from the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. And I know you will learn a lot about her contributions and her projects, so I want to kind of recognize that. In addition, she has been recognized by many multiple awards, which I'm not going to go through all of them uh, today, but I do want to highlight that she received the Division Medal of Honor for exceptional and sustained service to Division 50 of um, the addictions field, and that is decades of, of service. In addition, she received um, distinguished scientific recognitions in the field of clinical psychology, lifetime achievement awards, and in 2018, uh, the Betty Ford Award, which is a very distinguished in, uh, recognition. So those just is a selected uh, group of achievements that I wanted to, to share with you today. And then I said, okay, we know the contributions that are published and in papers and in teaching, but I think what really impacts us the most is how we impact the teams and the colleagues that have worked with us. So. I, these are quotes from a selected group of colleagues, many of them that have worked with her for 20, 30 years. And one of them, Jim Murphy, says she is one of the most influential alcohol researchers in the past 40 years. We have another colleague that says she's a brilliant scientist, and she highlights how Dr. Tucker's work has shifted paradigms in new programs. And that is where impact, that's what it really means. And then uh, Dr. Lehman, who was uh, the endowed professor uh, not long ago, highlighted one of the key qualities of Dr. Tucker, which is precision and high standards in everything that she is involved. So I want to highlight that. Today, you're going to have the opportunity to uh, learn from her and see her uh, research uh, and academic career. And in celebration of that, the department is going to uh, sponsor one of the bricks that we'll find at the front door of the Florida gym uh, building in recognition of this uh, achievement. We are here to celebrate you. We recognize you. And with no further delays, floor is yours. <laughs> Mildred, thank you. Mike, thank you. Mary, thank you. This is really important, not just to me, but to the department and to the college. And I am amazed and so grateful that all of you are here today. Can you hear me or not? Oh, dear. 
okay, this is, I knew this was going to happen. This mic apparently is for the streaming. Women always have trouble speaking in front of groups because we need a microphone. Can you hear me now? I'm going to probably have to move around. Okay. Um, from the diaphragm, okay. Um, I used to be a cheerleader. I really don't want to have to give this talk. Oh, Lord. Okay. Okay, to get started, because I know that this is timed and we do want to go to the reception, and I hope you can stay for that. I want to talk about the behavioral economics of addictive behavior change. And I want to talk about it in the context of how we reduce alcohol-related risks and problems. And I welcome this opportunity to share with you what I've learned over the last 40 years about this area, as well as how I have come to think about addiction and recovery. I really want to thank all the people that are listed up here. Um, there are others, but the main collaborators are shown in the blue box. You will recognize some of these folks. I also want to thank my current research staff and members of the Center for Behavioral Economic Health Research who are listed here. I want to thank Katie who sponsored my sabbatical in New Mexico and we did this edited book and we learned so much about micro to macro influences on recovery from alcohol use disorder. I also want to thank Mark and Linda Sobel, who were my mentors in graduate school and beyond, who got me started, and the support I've received over the years from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Can you hear me or not? This is hard. <laughs> what if I stand over here? What I want to do today is four things. I want to give you some basic facts about the nature of alcohol problems that we've learned in the last 50 years. Then I want to talk about behavioral economic approaches to reducing alcohol-related problems. Then I'm going to briefly describe two research projects. One is focused on natural recovery. The other is focused on environmental enrichment among risky drinkers who reside in the community who are not college students. And then I'll end with a few comments about future directions. When you think about the alcohol field, you can kind of divide it up into three eras. The first era I'm going to refer to as the pre-scientific era. And this is before the establishment of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and the National Institute on Drug Abuse during the Nixon administration in the early 1970s. And before that time, most of what we knew about the nature of problems, we learned from people who had the problem, mm -hmm. as well as from their care providers. And typically, the people that got care had really severe problems. And this skewed our understanding of the nature of alcohol problems in the direction of extreme severity, progressive disease. Then after the founding of NIAAA and NIDA, we had a lot of early research that was focused on the individual. Um, and it's what I like to call the iframe or individual level approach of trying to change individual behavior. Then in the 1990s, public health and population science started to get some attention in the field. And it expanded it to address the systems in which individuals operate. And I'm going to call this the S-frame for systems level. And my career development has followed and paralleled this shift. I want to start by just pointing out that alcohol problems are our most prevalent substance use problem by far. Despite all the attention that other drugs of abuse get in the media, alcohol problems are still more prevalent by far. They also vary over the lifespan. And people drink the most, they binge drink the most, and they smoke and use the most marijuana products from roughly the late teens through the late 20s and early 30s. And this is the period I'm going to call emerging adulthood. And it'll come up later when I talk about some of the research. 
in the United States, we have had two approaches to trying to deal with the drug problem. Drug supply reduction approaches and drug demand reduction approaches. And after many attempts with both of these, the consensus is that incentives and support for sobriety and harm reduction work better than legal penalties, interdiction, and incarceration for drug use and trafficking. And we have had two major S-frame national experiments using the drug supply side approach, and that's prohibition, and then the U.S. war on drugs. And in general, there's consensus that these have failed. They are associated with increased crime, violence, smuggling, higher incarceration rates. Our prison system has exploded with the war on drugs, and yet they've had little impact on drug use and problems. This is to be contrasted with approaches that focus on trying to reduce drug demand. And one of the main ways you do that is by enriching the environment with activities that can compete with drug use. This is one of the goals of reinforcement-based behavioral treatments. This is what happens in drug courts in lieu of prison. And then there are some S-frame level interventions from this approach, probably the best known of which is the Icelandic prevention model. You know, Iceland is an island, and so they could do this nationally. What they did was they enriched neighborhoods and communities with activities that didn't involve drug use, and the substance use rates in many, many, many different drug classes over a 20-year period plummeted in that country. People do recover. You can change these behaviors. And it typically occurs outside of the context of treatment. Natural recovery, which is what I study, is the dominant pathway to recovery. Positive outcomes encompass abstinence as well as low-risk drinking without problems. Low-risk drinking is more common among natural recovery samples and it's generally a more preferred drinking goal, although debate continues about who is able to achieve it, and some of the research I do is address that issue. This is the last fact slide I wanna show you. Um, it shows the relative health risk associated with drinking at different levels along the x-axis. That's the number of standard drinks consumed per day, and then the relative risk compared to abstainers is shown on the y-axis. And what you can see here is that if you only drink one or two or maybe even three drinks fairly regularly, the health risk associated with that are pretty minimal and not that different from abstaining. And then after that, it, it explodes. And so people that have really severe problems, they do need to abstain as a drinking goal. But for people who have less severe problems, Harm reduction or reduced drinking is a reasonable goal because any reduction in drinking does reduce morbidity and mortality. This is a famous quote from an experimental psychologist. I see Chris nodding back there um, from the mid-50s, that there's nothing more practical than a good theory. And in our case, the theory of interest is behavioral economics. Its precursor was behavioral theories of choice. And what the theory does is it tells us where to look and what we should investigate. There's so many different things that we could study, but the theory directs our attention to a limited number of variables. And then it tells us how to look, which is measurement. You know, what should we be measuring when we look at these phenomena? Behavioral economics, I know there's some of you in here that know what this is. But it is now a transdiscipline that has been useful in many, many different fields. And it started out as a merger of the basic behavioral science of choice with consumer demand theory and microeconomics. It tells us where to look. And what it tells us is to look into the context of choice. In other words, what's available and how much does it cost? 
in terms of your time, your money, and your effort. And this is very different than looking internally for a disease state or a mental state. It tells us what to measure. How are your resources distributed over time to the available activities and commodities in the context of choice? We infer preference from your resource allocation patterns. In other words, people vote with their feet. People vote with their money. If you want to know what people value, look at what they do with their time and their money. And this is well suited as an approach to studying substance misuse because the primary problem is excessive demand for drugs over time. From this perspective, we view people's lives as an accumulation of their choices. And their choices depend on context, what is available, and their time horizons for allocating their behavior and resources. Some people have tiny little time horizons. You know, they're not thinking much past maybe this weekend. Others are, have very lengthy time horizons that even extend beyond their lifetime. What we know is that if you change the context and you change the time horizon, you can change their behavior. And this is the crux of changing addictive behavior, which we regard as a disorder of choice behavior over time. So the goal is to shift the behavior allocation away from those small little rewards, which is drug use, toward later larger rewards that are made possible from a sober lifestyle. This slide concretizes this with an example. In a discrete choice, do you drink tonight or in an hour, uh, or you do something else like go to the gym, go to an AA meeting, in all likelihood the drinking is going to be preferred by somebody who has had a drinking problem. But a molar choice over an extended period of time is going to yield more rewards from a sober lifestyle pattern. And so what this shows is that you get more value by picking the molar pattern of sober behavior. And when you do this, you're likely to have benefits in your marriage or relationships. Your health may be improved. Your finances will almost certainly improve. And you're going to have more non-drinking choices, including opportunities that you're not going to have if you choose to have a problem drinking lifestyle. OK, moving on to the research. Mentioned early, earlier that natural recovery is the dominant pathway to recovery. And if we study the context that support that and the behavior allocation patterns that help or harm recovery, this can inform improvements and interventions. It also provides an opportunity to study low-risk drinking, which is more common in natural recovery. And it can inform how people can successfully moderate, even though most alcohol treatment programs still insist on abstinence as the proper goal. But to do this kind of research, you got to go out in the community, and you got to find these people, because they're not in your clinic. They're not in your treatment program. And then you have to measure their behavior. You follow them over time. You look at the context. And then you look at the outcomes over a period of time. So this map shows how we recruited our samples in these five prospective studies over a 23-year period. Started this work at Auburn University and continued it when I was at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and then actually they finished the data collection in the final study after I got here. Media advertisements, TV, newspaper, radio, they respond, we screen them, and then we go to them. And all of these trips were research assistants. They were driving all over the southeast to do data collection interviews with these participants. And we got over 600 people who had clinically diagnosable alcohol use disorder. 
with a mean problem duration of over 16 years and who had initiated a recent recovery attempt on their own outside of treatment or AA. And then we were able to do one-year follow-up assessments on 73% of them. Because proportional resource allocation is the main measure of your preference, what we did was we measured money. We measured what people spent on alcohol and other commodities and activities during the year before they quit problem drinking, and then we followed it for the year after problem drinking. And the main question was, how did their spending shift during the recovery attempt, and could this be related to their one-year outcomes? And the three outcome groups of interest are people that maintain continuous abstinence, people who were able to maintain moderation drinking without problems, and then an unstable resolution group of individuals who had one or more relapse episodes. The major findings, similar to clinical samples, lower problem severity predicted stable recovery, particularly stable moderation. During the year after quitting heavy drinking, as expected, all the groups showed shifts in spending away from alcohol towards non-drinking commodities and activities. But the group that was able to moderate successfully, they showed distinctive spending patterns both before and after quitting problem drinking, whereas the abstinent and relapse groups were more similar and different. This is the most dense slide I'm going to show you, but I want to illustrate what I mean about differences in their spending. Over here on this side, this is from the pre-resolution year when all of them were drinking very heavily. This is their spending on alcoholic beverages, which is not the same thing as what they drink, just FYI. Um, and then also the money that they voluntarily put into savings for the future. Even when drinking heavily, the group that successfully moderated had more balanced spending on alcohol and what they put it into savings for the future, which suggests that they were more sensitive to future consequences and they had longer time horizons than the other two groups who tended to spend on rewarding things like entertainment and recreation, you know, smaller little chunks. During the post-resolution year, all the groups showed shifts away from alcohol. But the moderation group, even though they had been good savers when they were heavy drinkers, <coughs> by the middle of that post-resolution year, they started spending. And they started spending on big ticket items, things like houses, durable goods, associated insurance. And this is after they had had an initial period of stable moderation and they hadn't blown it. They took a chance. They, they spent a lot of money on things that would benefit them for a long time into the future. The other groups tended to, like I said, spend on smaller rewards that didn't have as high a value. So this is the graph for that category. And overall, the group that moderated ended up receiving, through their behavior, higher consumption bundles that included some drinking without problems. Okay, moving on to the second line of research. This is focused on emerging adults who are in that risk group, roughly ages 18 to 29. This is a period of risk taking, including heavy drinking, and it's a key age for risk reduction interventions. But college students have gotten the bulk of attention, including alcohol prevention. And so our interest was in their peers who lived in relatively disadvantaged neighborhoods who are underserved and harder to reach. They're not on campus. You can't just put ads out and get them to come be in your study. You gotta go find them. And as a group, compared to college students, they often have fewer opportunities, activities, and adult roles that present 
rewarding alternatives to heavy drinking. So as is very typical in health behavior research programs, we started with a health risk needs assessment. Then we did a feasibility study to show that we could recruit our people the way we wanted to using respondent-driven sampling, which I'll show you in a minute. And this led to our current NIH and IAAA grant, which we call the UF Horizon Study for short. Okay, the way this works, and there are people in the room that do this, um, and two people on the research team who are of similar demographic characteristics as our target sample, they go out into relatively disadvantaged communities and recruit, and they recruit what we call seeds who have the characteristics of interest. They're risky drinkers. The seeds are trained how to recruit their peers. Then their peers recruit their peers, and those peers recruit their peers. And on and on it goes until we get the sample size that we want. In the studies at UF that we've done, we have moved the peer recruitment and all data collection online. Still go out in the street and recruit the seeds. And in the next 20 slides, Justin, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to show you the month-to-month -month sample development using respondent-driven sampling, then the feasibility study that we've completed. The seeds are in triangles, the squares are the peers. The negative consequences, they all had negative consequences, but those above and below the median are shown in orange and blue, respectively. Okay, that's how RDS works. And this is over a 20-month period. We ended up having 176 seeds, 357 peer recruits, uh, mean age 23 and a half years. In most RDS studies, we don't quite know why, but more women tend to do it than men. And this is another way of looking at the sample. And this shows you how this RDS process can really fan out from your point of origin, which is the University of Florida and the um, Red Star. And we were focused initially on North Central Florida, and then the peer-to-peer -peer recruitment made this go out all over the state, except for out in the Panhandle and down there in the Everglades. Um, but you can see we ended up with good representation in Central Florida, as well as on both coasts, down in the Miami area and the Tampa area. This led to the grant project. And here's the design of the grant project. It is a randomized controlled trial that is evaluating an online behavioral intervention to increase future orientation and engagement in pro-social alternatives to drinking. And it is compared with an assessment only basic health education control condition. The seeds are recruited on the street and thereafter, everything is online, including the initial assessment, the intervention or control procedures, and then we have follow-up assessments online at one, six, and 12 months after enrollment. The intervention itself has two major components. One is US Thrive, and this is a very brief computerized intervention that's based on motivational interviewing principles to promote use of protective behavioral strategies to reduce drinking risk. The other component is the substance-free activity session. This was pioneered by Jim Murphy. Rob Lehman had a lot to do with Thrive. Um, this intervention includes a time allocation assessment. What are you doing with your time? And then 
and identification of rewarding non-drinking activities. Then there is a goal setting and envisioning the future exercise that's aimed at connecting their present behavior to their future goals. And given this group, this young group, we're only looking at a three month window. Okay, we're, not, we're not going way out, but that's a long time to some of these younger people. This is in progress, it's not done, but I did want to list some of the features of it that I think are innovative. The first is that it is a web-based alcohol reduction intervention that is focused on behavioral economic principles. We're using a peer-driven sampling method and a digital platform that's very well suited to accessing emerging adult networks. This age group live on their phones. And the dynamics of online communities on the phone are very, very similar to in-person social networks. This is not only a randomized intervention evaluation, but we're also evaluating a peer network dissemination method that has high potential for reach and scalability to underserved community risk groups, not just with alcohol, but with other kinds of problems. We're also including a social network analysis to inform intervention development that targets both the individuals as well as their social networks. And Chris McCarty is the expert on the grant for that. So to finish up, I want to put this up here. This kind of sums up where I think the field is going and what we need to be doing in the future. The socio-ecological model that's shown here has been around since the mid-1990s. It puts the behavior of individuals at the center of these series of concentric circles that go out into influences on them, into their social networks, their relationships, into their community, their workplaces, and then to the societal level, including policies, laws, and regulations. At this point, we have a good understanding, I think, of individual level variables that are associated with drinking and risk reduction. And this is thank you to the clinical sciences. There's been an amazing amount of work done on this. But we have been slow to integrate population science and public health on, into this line of work, namely what it has shown about contextual variables that are associated with drinking problems and risk reduction. What we know from this line of research is that communities that have greater alcohol access that are, have higher poverty and especially higher income inequality are more likely to have more drinking problems and poorer outcomes. And this is contrasted with communities and neighborhoods that have greater access to health care, that have greater access to mental health care, and to alcohol-free pro-social activities that can compete with alcohol. We're talking parks, we're talking gyms, we're talking bike riding trails. Um, many of you study these things in this room, I know that. Um, this is very consistent with the behavioral economic analysis and the emphasis that it places on environmental enrichment, which is an upstream, upstream way to reduce substance use. The systems that are shown in the socio-ecological model are where a lot of the rewarding alternatives to drinking come from and where I think we need to focus more attention. So last slide, I want to give a shout out to the Center for Behavioral Economic Health Research. This word cloud shows many different topics that Center members are concerned with and involved with, not just substance use many different things. And I think that collectively, the next frontier for behavioral science and health promotion is to understand individual behavior and behavior change in the broader context in which it occurs. We need to intervene across both I-frame and S-frame levels and study the interaction between the two to find optimal approaches to intervention. 
behavioral economics gives you tools in order to do this across levels and across frames. And I would welcome any of you to join us in the Sea Bear. It's a multidisciplinary home for these initiatives. So thank you very much for your time and attention. that we all want to uh, take a moment to speak with Dr. Tucker about this amazing, Jay Lee, I've, I've listened to you refer to this work for 10 years. I feel like I've understood more in the last 30 minutes than I did up until now. So thank you so much for that, it's terrific. Um, to honor this occasion and to honor this individual, um, we have a small gift that we would like to give Dr. Tucker. In fact, can you come up here and do this? Yes, we are told to stand on the tape. Yes. So this is a medal that we have commissioned uh, to celebrate this event for Dr. Tucker, um, Jay Lee, with our deep appreciation from the college. Thank you so much. Of course. I really mean that. Of course. Insanely wonderful. Thank you. No, I think it built very nice on you. You don't have to later. <laughs> so I'm not sure everybody heard, but Jay Lee said she'll put it on at the reception. <laughs> so that's a great lead in. Um, we are finished with our formal session here. We now get an opportunity to visit with one another and get better acquainted and congratulate Jay Lee on her accomplishment and congratulate and thank um, Mary Lane for the generosity and support of this endowed professorship. On your way there, and it's just down the hallway, you can't miss it, it's all the way down the hallway on your left. Um, there's a screen that's set up here. If you would like to catch photos of yourself with a UF background, it's a great place to stand with friends or with family and get a selfie or have someone take a photo for you. Um, but we have a reception down the hall at the Dean Suite. Uh, there will be champagne. There will be hors d'oeuvres. Uh, we hope that you will come and spend uh, a happy moment with us and congratulate Dr. Tucker. Again, Jaylee, thank you.